probably all know that we are Wanderlust. Um, we create experiences in places you aren't supposed to be, um, but we're very glad to be welcome here at Kickstarter. We have uh, a very um, exciting panel here. Um, Oh, me? Who am I? I don't know. Who are you? This is N.D. Austin, the mysterious N.D. Austin. I'm sure you recognize his mustache. He is half of Wanderlust. I'm the other half. My name's Ida Benedetto. Um, uh, yeah, and, and so we uh, are extremely lucky not only to be here at Kickstarter, but to have some of the smartest, uh, most innovative folks doing, bringing creativity and commerce together. And these people, we thought, had particularly interesting things to say about money. Um, why it's filthy, why it's nasty, why you can't live without it, and why we all want it. Um, so, uh, do you want to? Sure. Um, Frank Lance is uh, our moderator today. There's a bio of it. Do we want to? That, that's all we're going to say. Everyone, this is Frank. <laughs> Yancey is uh, partially responsible for this whole place. Everyone, Yancey. This is Molly. Thanks for being here, Molly. JR. JR just flew in from Paris literally moments ago. Thank you for being here with us. And Ingrid. Thanks for joining us, guys. Uh, we really look forward to wherever you're going to go. We asked all of you to be here today because we wanted to learn from people whose values that we admire. And uh, each of you, in some way, has has something that we look up to and we think, ah, oh, they ha they're doing it right. How are they doing? What, what, what? We don't know. <laughs> We're really excited to learn. Anything else? Um, uh, take notes and have tough questions at the end. Yeah, you all have notebooks. I know you all have notebooks. So we want your toughest questions uh, prepared for them. They're, they're ready for it. They're ready to get grilled. Awesome. Let's hear it for these. Yay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ida and Nathan. Um, all right, so let's jump in and get right to the heart of the matter. I'm going to maybe go through and ask each one of you just to tell me how you make money and how that affects what you do. So why don't we start with you? How, how do you make money? Um, well, right now I make money by giving uh, other people money. So I, uh, uh, my, my main job at the Tribeca Film Institute is I run a fund for interactive storytelling. And the Tribeca Film Institute very nicely pays me a salary for doing that. And um, has that changed much for you in, in, in your career? What, how I make what, Yeah, what, what you do now, how does that relate to, to what you've done well, previously? I, well, I think maybe, I don't know, maybe one of the reasons that I was invited to be on this panel is I've actually always um, been in a position where I've kind of facilitated other people's creativity, mm -hmm. mostly by grant giving. Um, and so I, I guess I think a lot about how artists get money because I, and it's not my own money that I'm giving, by the way. Um, I haven't figured out how to make money. Um, <laughs> but I, um, I, I think what I try to do is think about really creative ways to um, bring money to artists. And I think a lot about um, how you can create mark that art mark, art um, that's outside of the market in some ways or hovers on the sort of weird edge between the market and something else. Uh, documentaries being, I think, one really good example of that. Cool. Um, JR, how do you make money and how does that affect what you do? Um, I guess, yeah, the, 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 the one of the main questions for me is uh, where that money comes from. And in, in the work that I produce, I've always make sure that it comes from the sales of artwork, so something that I give in exchange and not from any kind of sponsoring or, or, or like, uh, yeah, sponsoring, uh, having brands basically paying for any project. This, this is a way for me to just uh, self-finance everything that I start and so kind of drive the projects where I want them to be taken and not where a brand or, uh, um, you know, uh, another strategy for a product or anything else would want this project to go. So this is something that I've constantly been trying to, to make sure I focus on the work. But there's also another aspect of the work is that 99% of what I produce is actually non-physical. It's not for sale. Mm. It's just a experience. It's just about being there in an action. And that's 99% of what I do. And this one other person, which is physical object, like most of, like 99 of the artists in the world does, that one person financed the, the other 99. So that's the, the, the model, basically. Okay. 
In video games, we call those people whales. But uh, also in uh, casinos, that's what they're named. Uh, but um, so you're known for this like crazy street art that's out that's not an, an object that people can physically take and buy and purchase. Um, what are the types of stuff that, that you're selling? How does that relate to the stuff that's out in the world that you're doing is this more kind of guerrilla mm. stuff? I guess th th there's two parts. There's the stuff that, um, that I do mm -hmm. and that I document and, and that I sell caption of. Uh, but it's out there in the street. So I, actually, if you want to document it yourself and if you want to just take that image on the internet, I mean, basically, what I sell is not for sale in a way. Because if you want it, you <laughs> can have it without paying for it. So the people who decide to pay it, to pay for it, uh, they, they get a, a print of something that I photograph myself. But they decide, they don't really decide to buy a photo because the photo is not even there. They decide to become the 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 doorkeeper or the 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 how do you say the safe. Mm -hmm. They they put this artwork in a safe basically in their home for the future for just to, because it's ephemeral out there in the street. It doesn't stay for long. Yeah. So by having this original piece, they're basically going to protect it and let it go through generation, where you know uh, 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 posters and stuff like that might not last that long. So basically, those images are out there for anyone who wants to have them, you know, as screensaver or as printing, as posters, whatever you want to have it. And and just a few number of people are basically paying for that whole operation, but in the shadow of it. Nice, um, Molly. How do you make money, and how does that relate to your life and what you do? So I'm an artist and a writer, and as an artist, I've made money every single possible way an artist can made, make money. I've sold originals of my paintings. I've gone to refugee camps in Lebanon, and I've illustrated them for the New York Times. When I was 18, I used to make a considerable chunk of my very, very small living drawing people's pets for money. I would hang up uh, flyers in delis and um, do it for $20 a pop. I've done book covers. I've done newspaper articles. I've done advertising campaigns. I've done ludicrous jobs, and I've done things that I'm really proud of. But any way that I could draw for money, I probably have. Nice. All right, Yancy, how do you make money? Uh, I get paid a salary um, uh, here at Kickstarter. Uh, Kickstarter is a system we make money when other people get the money they need to make something. Um, so the way our system works is that uh, if someone raises the money they need to create the thing they want to create, we charge 5% of what they raise as a fee, and we use that to pay the employees and insurance for 79 people who work on behalf of those people to help them do their projects. Um, we always liked from the beginning that we only got paid if other people got paid. So if you don't make your goal, we don't take anything at all, even though it requires the same level of work from us. Um, so yeah, so I guess it's kind of a commission-based system, you could argue. Mm -hmm. But yeah, pretty straightforward. Nice. Um, all right, now I just want to ask an open question and see if anybody um, has thoughts about this. Um, what do you not like about your current situation in terms of how you make money? Is there something that you wish was different, uh, a different way of doing what you do uh, for a living? Is there a part of the structure by how you make money that you wish could be changed or, or different? Anybody have a... Or you, is everyone pretty much happy? Like, oh yeah, this works, or is well, it like, ah, this is frustrating? I don't think it's necessarily how I make money, but I, I mean, and this is like a whole other thing, but I mean, I do think a lot about what gets valued in our mm -hmm. culture and society. And, you know, I mean, especially now that you know, there's all these ideas around, um, you know, uh, this whole idea about working hard and, and making money that way. And obviously that, you know, kind of, it, it erases the, all these people who work incredibly hard and who are still only ever going to earn min minimum wage. And I don't know if you saw that um, minimum wage calculator that the New York Times did, where you know you could you'd have to work out how many hours you'd have to work. And I realized if I was working minimum wage to earn the salary I'm earning now, I would have to work a full-time job plus 55 hours extra a week. You know, it's it just kind of it's ridiculous. And I think about this a lot because I you know I, I think a lot about. Um, <coughs> I, I used to work in, the, in public broadcasting in the, in the UK, and you know one of the reasons that they had a strong public broadcasting system is because documentaries have to kind of exist I in that kind of system because otherwise they, the market doesn't really, the, you know, supply and demand is like so complicated around creating things like documentaries, um, really good documentaries around really interesting subjects. And so I think one of the things that I really struggle with, and it's one of the reasons I love doing what I do, is just how you 
kind of how you negotiate that, you know, how you negotiate like what gets valued and then what you value. And when there's a discrepancy between the two, I think it, sometimes it makes me feel really uncomfortable because I start to think that I'm kind of imagining things a little bit. And I know I'm not, and I work love. I mean, I work in a great community where that gets you know underlined all the time. But I think it it does lead to a kind of weird schizophrenia in some ways, where you're constantly feeling like you know why why is it that what we support, which we know is so important, doesn't really always have a business model, <laughs> and that's something that I still struggle with a little bit. Well, I I think it's because value is determined by the perceived capacity of something to make more money for other people. I mean, that seems to be what we don't base value on utility necessarily. It seems like in the past 60 years especially, it's about the potential for it to make other people money, uh, which has led to a really uh, winnowing down uh, of what is viable. Um, and that was certainly something that we thought a lot about with doing our thing, was trying to create an entirely different perspective where not making money could be a glorious reason for something to exist. It's not a strike against it. Yeah, and I mean, I have to say that, that is one of the great things is that not only does it allow projects that may have no, you know, financial reason to exist, um, but are awesome. But I think it also, um, it actually kind of does the opposite of what I was just talking about to the person who's giving money to that project. It's like you feel part of something really important. And it actually, I think, doesn't make you feel like it's, you know, you, you I think there is something about that relationship between the person who's, who's pledging money and the person who's making the project that's really important. So where does the money uh, come from, Ingrid, when you're giving out, so you, you're at the Tribeca Film Institute, correct? Mm -hmm. And when you're working with a, a talented young filmmaker who wants to make a, a non, mostly non-commercial documentary film, um, if you help that person get that film funded, where's the money coming from? So our, the, money, the money for the fund that I, the specific fund I run comes from the Ford Foundation. So it's, you know, it's a foundation that's been around for a long time. Um, and the great thing is it's a straight grant, so we actually don't require, we're not, we, we don't put equity investment and we don't re require any money back. Um, so if the project makes loads of money, that's great. If the project makes no money, I mean, it's not great obviously for the filmmaker, but we don't, that, that's not why we put money into projects. We don't ask to look at their business plan when we give money to a, to a film. What are other sources of funding for, for documentary films? So that's, that's the Ford Foundation, which is a, a non-for-profit organization attached to a large corporation, right? Uh, well, it's no longer attached to it's, a corporation. But it used to be. The money so it, came from the, the money came from Ford, cars. the cars, the right. car maker. Okay. And, um, but then it, now it's just a pool of money that is, it, 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 someone, the, someone who made cars thought, you know what, I don't need all this money. I think I'm going to use it for, to make the world a better place, so right. funding things like this. Right. Um, so that's one model, right? right? That's, I guess it's kind of traditional in a sense. It's been around for a long time. Especially uh, here in the U.S. That's a yeah. very, very particular American model, I think. It's an American model. It's kind of related to just any situation in which someone amasses a great deal of wealth. And then as a, as a patron, they, they might hire a, a musician to come and play music for them, or they might um, <clears throat> hire a sculptor to make a big monument uh, in the town square, and that improves the town, presumably. Um, what are the other sources of, of funding that you guys work with? Well, specifically related to documentary, so there's government money, very little, but there is a little bit. The mm -hmm. National Endowment for the Arts, for example. Um, that's tricky, right, because it doesn't go directly to the, it can't go directly to artists, it can only go uh, to organizations like ours, and then we give it to the artists. Um, because otherwise, terrible, terrible things happen. I'm kidding. <laughs> Robert Mablethorpe will happen. Yeah, <laughs> there'll be penises everywhere. Um, uh, what else? Sorry, I'm distracted now. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Oh, we're in second life. <laughs> so there's government money. Uh, obviously, in some countries, that's that, that's a little bit bigger than than here. Uh, there's um, foundation money we just talked about. There's equity investments, um, VC money a little bit, not really in documentaries so much. Um, there's, uh, what else is there? There's uh, brand money, um, increasingly, actually. Um, there, and then Which we've heard about JR saying he's not interested in. Right. Yeah, what, right. Do you think? Yeah. what do you think about that? I'm so conflicted about that because it's, and, <coughs> and, and now I think there are different ways of that money being circulated, right? Because I think how, how well, it gets so complicated. I am really conflicted about it because I you know, think if you're making a documentary about the meat industry and it's sponsored by anyone, uh, Tyson, Chipotle, right. you're already in really murky waters. <laughs> that said, I also, you know, I'm, I'm a pragmatist and I also understand that there are, uh, there are blurred lines increasingly and I mean especially when you no longer have, um, you know, big chunks of support where like most films aren't fully financed by, from one source of, of, of income. You're, you're also piecing together money here, there and everywhere. 
I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, How about I, this as a model? It's a short documentary film. It's like 30 seconds long. And you show it in really between short. television shows. <laughs> yeah. And it's sponsored by Oscar Meyer or yeah, something like I, that. Right, Would you like, okay. that's, so that's, that's that, a model. That's where, that's where my, that's where my sort of doubt comes in because I used to work at Channel 4. We, we showed incredible documentaries. This is, you know, back in the day uh, when they would show documentaries in peak, in peak time on TV. And of course it was all... Channel 4 Channel in four, sorry, England. Channel 4 television. Yeah, we're thinking England. like and, NBC. And Channel Channel four, NBC. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, I was yeah. wondering why you were like... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, we showed incredible documentaries, really hard-hitting documentaries, and of course it was advertising supported. You're absolutely right. So that's why I'm saying I think that it depends how that money is given. And, and the relationship, um, but, I, but, but I think that there are very, very murky waters there around right. editorial integrity. Okay, so that's some of the stuff you struggle with. Anyone else have a, have like, is there a negative impact on, on, your, on the work that you're doing or on what you do on a daily basis based on how you make money and is there friction there that, that frustrates you at all? Well, this isn't about how I personally make money, but it's sort of about the fine art system. The fine art system in many ways is rigged to keep artists poor. The traditional way that you would work is you would spend maybe a year, two years creating a body of work. Um, you would take it to a gallery. Um, the gallery would, if they liked it, offer you a show you know, in a number of months or years. They would sell as much of it as they could. Um, some of it you know, might be unsold. Then they would cut you a check afterwards. Meanwhile, while you were leading up to that show, you were fronting all the costs to produce the show and you weren't getting paid yourself. To me, I've never, I've never worked in this model because I never had a traditional gallery interested in me, but to me, I look at this model and I'm like, how does that make sense? How do, how do people eat while they're creating their show? And obviously, some people are working as adjuncts or they um, have trust funds or they get that tiny, tiny, tiny sliver of grant money or they're, they're doing some other job, but to me, this entire system is profoundly broken. What do you think, uh, JR, about the art world and how that's... Structured. No, I, I think w when you decide to be an artist, you, you decide to to live on, on a certain edge, and, and you can live from that edge, you know, at certain moment of your life, and at other moments you might not. But the, the real base of even you know working with artists, with filmmaker and stuff is that y you work with a non-business model. So it's actually that what makes it interesting. That's what pushing our borders. That's what you know uh, showing us like that the limits are not necessarily where we think they are. So I guess that that's, that's also part of the, the downside is that there's moments where you might have some good time and other moments that you might struggle and, it's, and, and it can't be only good times because if not you would create a business model and you would be stuck in it. So it means that you would know that only that painting would work and you would create only that same painting. It's by putting your whole system in risk constantly that you might triumph or fail, but at least you've tried which in other business model you don't. You have, to, you have to make profit. So you have to go into a certain direction that would only make profit. If not, it's a failure. As an artist, you have the right to fail. So why not try? So, I mean, you know, uh, uh, for me, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's like you said, you can do any kind of job. And I, I've, done, you know, I've done it all also. And, and I'm not afraid to go back and do you know, any kind of jobs because I was as happy when I was doing those jobs. And, uh, being an artist as a hobby, and I'm artist full time, and, and and you know I can I can live from it. But um, uh, the importance is, is is really why you started it and how you keep that on the long term, on the long way. And so the, that's that's I guess for me the only thing that I would try to protect. So of course there's some moment where you have some friction and some moment that it's perfect, but it it can it cannot be. And I'm already already like you know, resigned to that, it cannot be that perfect for that long. So you'll have to constantly reinvent the model. And that's, that's part of it. And that push you to constantly rethink, you know, that, you know, I used to have brands that come to see me to put their logos on my posters. And I would be, no, you know, uh, fuck you. And then they would come back and say, no, we understand your model. So why don't we, um, what did they say? Uh, they say, yeah, we, we're gonna, you, we let you do your thing, but we do a press communique that we help you do it. And then I uh, said, no, you know what, still not interested. And then they, they came with their own foundation. And they said, no, it's not us. It's the foundation of the same name, you know, helping you. And, uh, and so I was like, you know, no, still not. And, and the more it went, the more you, I've seen the model changes and how they communicate and how they would use, uh, you know, artists especially that use the streets because it's like 
maybe walls that they couldn't get, and then they're like, oh, maybe through you we're going to get. Or the authenticity that you've built as an artist and that they're trying to buy as a brand. And so I've never done it just because I've never found, I, I'm not against branding, I'm just, I've just never found the moment where I'll be like, yeah, we'll be on a win-win situation. And, uh, and, and I don't really like that thing of I scratch your back, you scratch mine, and, and that's a, a, you know, a way that a lot of artists work. It's like, yeah, I get that big chunk of money. And, uh, or like you, know, it's, like you said, I, I, I was in a plane, I watched a movie about the ocean, and, and it starts by, uh, it's financed by the Fondation Total, you know, the, the, the guys that are destroying the whole ecosystem. I mean, even if it's the best image that I've never seen of whales going underwater and going up, and I, I, you know, I'm not ready to listen whatever you got to tell me if it's sponsored by those exact guys that you know, are killing the oceans. Mm -hmm. Those kind of contradictions for me, just, I mean, I, I would have loved to watch that film, but at the first frame, if it doesn't just make sense, uh, um, you know, I, I can't do it. You know, I think that it's interesting. So m my wife uh, makes websites for artists, uh, among other people, and, and uh, this, there's, a, there's a tension in, in art, I think, especially, uh, between the, uh, you know, the, the idea that, that what you're doing is, is done from a, a sense of purpose and, and a, a kind of a deep expression of, of a need to, to communicate and uh, you know, versus this idea that you're doing something and, and it has a concrete benefit to you that someone's going to buy it, and, and you know, um, and so she was asking, like, she was asking, do, like, do artists have business cards? And I was saying, no, they don't. Like, artists don't. Like, typically, an artist doesn't have a business card, right? And um, she was like, well, why not? I mean, they 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 have to meet people and you know get you know do deals and they, how is people remember their name and their email and so. But, but, you know, it's like there's this notion, there's a kind of romantic image of the artist that, um, that what art is, is it like it creates a space outside of commerce, right? It creates, we need this. Like even if we live in a world that's shot through with, 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 with money and deal making, that we somehow, we need a, a realm beyond that. And art kind of symbolizes that. I mean, is it true? So I'm asking the, the artist on the panel to, do you sense that, um, is that just romantic BS or is there, is there truth to the idea that um, that artists should kind of like, you know, put you know, create a space around what they're doing that, that kind of separates it from, you know, the the material hustle and bustle of of doing business. Well, it's very interesting that art is seen as the space that's separate from the material, considering that what we do is intrinsically entwined with the material. I mean. You do gigantic paste-ups of these beautiful photos on walls. Your thing is involved with paste and paper and installation. I do gigantic paintings on wood. Um, what we're able to do is actually intrinsically bound up with how many, much money and resources we have. Um, my last show, which was the most ambitious of my life, I you know, put in 15 hours a day doing these gigantic paintings about revolutions in 2011. I killed myself over them. I wouldn't have been able to do it if I didn't, in the way that I did, if I didn't have the money and connections that I'd accumulated. I mean, I think about the rat-infested <laughs> tenement that I lived in 10 years ago on the sixth floor, and I think about, would I even have been able to take those giant wood boards up the stairs? Um, would I have enough light to do it? Um, my windows all faced brick walls. Um, would I have enough space to do it? I was sharing one room with two girls. Of course money is intrinsically bound up with that. And if I say, oh no, it has nothing to do with that, I'm basically spitting in the face of all of these broke geniuses who don't have the resources that I have and saying that, oh no, you're not doing this big ambitious work because you're just inferior to me, when in reality they just might not have the privilege or opportunity. I think also, um, you know, like there's weird, the way that we, and I think artists are particularly, um, I, I mean, uh, people actually work in the arts in general are, 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 are like this often is, imbuing money with, it's like we're so, we, we, we sort of think money's not important, but we, because of the way that we work in, 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 in art, um, we're thinking about it all the time because we put ourselves in positions where we have to. And I think one of the things that, like, and this is something I realize, where there's this great organization called Creative Capital who give money to artists and they support artists o over time, which is I think really important as well. Um, and they do this creative capital retreat where they sort of train artists to do exactly what you were talking about, like thinking about the circle of support around their work, thinking about things like how do they pitch their work, even if it makes them feel deeply uncomfortable. Right. You know, do you have an ele elevator pitch for your art? 
you know, you can see artists just being like, ugh. Um, <laughs> But by the end of it, everyone was in tears because I think that they'd sort of realized there were all these things that they were doing. And one of them was around money. And I've never seen so many people weep because there was this woman there who like basically said, look, you all have very emotional... The way you think about money is very emotional. And it means that you try not to think about money because you don't think it's important. But because of the way that you've built your life and your art, you're thinking about it all the time. And you're spending more time doing that than you are doing your art. And so what you have to do is like try and figure out a way to manage your money so that you can spend more time doing your art. And like, you could just see like, the, kind of, like, the veil lift from all these people because it's so, I think that's really true. And I don't think that's just true of artists. I think that's true of a lot of people who, well, I think it's true of a lot of people. Right. But especially people who work in sort of the culture industry. It's so interesting. I never, but, like by thinking about money a little bit more, you could think about it way less. less. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly oh, what they were really saying. That's really interesting. Like, yeah. If you stop thinking that money is this big evil thing that you know, is like beneath you. Right then you'll stop thinking about it all the time. Um, and actually, it's a tool. And of course, yes, we, you know, like, uh, whatever your feelings are about money and how it circulates in capitalism and what has worth, at the end of the day, you need it to make your art. You need it to live. So figure out the smaller steps to get the furthest distance to make that happen. And it was really like it was, unfortunately, I didn't quite actually implement it in my life, but I did. No, it did it's a great idea. <laughs> it made me think differently, you know. And I think one of the things she said as well is w- women in particular do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but artists do it a lot, and I think that's true. Wow, it's fascinating. Um, yes, I want to ask you, so you are kind of an inventor, right? I mean, you kind of invented a thing, right? It's a system. It's a different way of, of like, dealing with these issues. Um, and it has had a huge impact on how a lot of creative people uh, do their work. Um, is it, I mean, in the, um, like, are there, like, I, I guess I, I want to, um, to ask whether that has been uh, a mixed bag or totally good. Like, so, for example, in the, in the indie game world, um, the, the industry has changed because of, there's been this emergence of, like, smaller scale work that people are using Kickstarter and other kinds of, of non-traditional revenue models and, and things like that. Um, and it's allowed people to work uh, in a way that's outside the, 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 the older structures. Um, and the older structures were these large studios. They had marketing departments. And by and large, game designers hated marketing departments. The marketing department was a sort of evil um, other that you could project all of these tensions about you know, how your work is going to be perceived in the market and whether, it'll be, whether it will sell and all of the kind of tensions and trade-offs could be offloaded onto that. Now, um, we hated marketing departments so much that we became them. You know what I mean? In a weird way, now, if you're kickstarting something, you have, you're responsible for doing your own marketing, for being your own marketing department. And, I, and I, in some ways, I think that's a good thing um, because you can no longer just offload all of those issues, you have to just deal with them. But in some ways, it's a bad thing because now you have to start from that perspective. You can't necessarily um, ignore it. And sometimes ignoring it felt good. So have, is that something that you've thought about? And, and, and do you have any opinions about that? Sure. Uh, well, I'm one of three people who created Kickstarter. OK. Uh, uh, Perry and Charles were my partners. But um, yeah, I think it's been a great thing. Uh-huh. I, I'm glad it's happened. Uh, before this, I was a music critic and a writer, and really working for $75 a pop, writing about records for the Village Voice and places like that, uh, and then started working on this with my friend. Um, and so we all came from a place of wanting something like Kickstarter. But I think our experience doing this has been somewhat atypical for a few reasons. Um, one, we've never really been very interested in being like businessmen. Uh, we're ideologues whose ideas happen to catch on to a, a kind of amazing degree. Um, and so from the very beginning, you know, one of the, like a moment that you do when you're starting a, a company, uh, a for-profit company, is you take, you have investors and you go see venture capitalists and do that sort of thing. And normally the terms of these deals are, all right, well, we're going to give you X amount of money, uh, but in exchange, you are giving up a say in how things go. Uh, you're giving up a, a stake in the organization. and really like your fate is no longer truly controlled by you. And that's like a, a said or an implicit agreement that happens along with it. And eventually the company keeps growing and you have to raise more money and some more people have the right to have a say. At a certain point someone can buy the organization that you've spent years building and you honestly can't stop it. 
it's up to like five people who've collectively given you like $30 million and that's their call. Uh, and this is the path that companies go on. And um, the whole system is engineered in this way. Um, from the very beginning, we always wanted to try to build a cultural institution, but like a living and breathing one. Um, and everyone who we talked to about taking money, uh, we told them, well, we will never sell our company and we will never try to go public. We're gonna do this till the day we die. Um, this is like the greatest thing we could imagine doing. And so everyone had to agree to that. Um, later we found out that some people agreed to that just didn't believe us. And they're just like, people say that kind of shit. Uh, but we meant it, um, we meant it. And so the beauty of that, the beauty of that plus this actually being a pretty successful organization means that we can kind of do what we want. And if we, if we make a mistake, it's because I made a mistake, not because I was told to make a mistake. Um, but it also puts us in a fortunate position to act in a moral way that actually matters, where people are watching and you can make hard decisions that demonstrate integrity over greed. Uh, and that's a real privilege to get to do. And those are things that I don't think that we're special snowflakes for thinking about things in that way. I think that we have a greater opportunity to do so because we don't have a lot of really rich dudes breathing down our necks saying it should go this way or that way. Um, and so we're in a fortunate position and we're trying to take advantage of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's definitely been an amazing opportunity to like express our worldview, you know, through this way and standing up for something that we think is worth defending and that people have been taking for granted. I mean, hearing about, thinking about money, I mean, when we were starting this, you know, I always thought about money as, this is very close to a cliche, but money is ultimately equaling time. You know, uh, it was like to not have a day job and to be able to have the time to do what you want and to like devote your energy to the thing you want to do. And that was like, that was true wealth. Um, and I think we struggle for other means of measuring value beyond money, but I think there's ones far greater than that. There was a guy who um, testified in front of a House subcommittee in Congress like 10 years ago uh, about the evil of GDP. GDP is gross domestic product. It's the primary measurement of the health of an economy. And he gave this talk about how, um, I think it was Keynes, Keynes that created GDP as a measurement. And when he created it, he was like, this is just like a, a hack thing, just measuring the amount of money that's flowing right now. We shouldn't really use this. This is just like total shortcut. But of course, if you put something out there, it becomes a default, and then you can't escape it. And this guy gives the testimony. He talks about the fact that GDP is solely looking for more, more money to be spent. It makes, no, it makes no judgment on how the money is spent or what type of money mm. is spent on. So according to GDP, the perfect society would be one where every member of it was had terminal cancer, was going through a divorce, uh, ate out every night, mm -hmm. and drove an SUV. And that is a perfect economy from a perspective of GDP. Now, we all know that that would be a, a totally unsustainable, terrible world, but we struggle to find ways of measurement that go beyond that. Right. And so I think of money as kind of the same way. Like, like thinking of wealth maybe in terms of money and the other things. I mean, for being an artist, you're probably way broker than anyone realizes, but you have like, the aura yeah. of being capital T, capital A, the artist. And that's worth something. You probably go to better parties than I do. Uh, <laughs> but like, so there's just like this mix of all these different things. And like, there isn't just this one thing, but we have a whole world that's geared around this one thing. You know, it's like life is gamified and there's a score and it's called money. And that's basically what we're all judging ourselves on. And we just need alternate systems or models that allow people to take a wider view of their life. It is weird. There's something funny talking about money. I mean, money is, it's strange, right? I mean, there's just being able to ask people how they make money. I'm like imagining asking all of you how much money you have. Like, I'm not going to do it, but it's like, it's, there's kind of a weird thrill yeah. to be allowed to come up here and like talk about money because it's kind of a forbidden thing. I guess it's like sex or maybe religion or politics to a certain degree. It, there's this kind of like unspoken thing. And why is that, do you think? Why is money so weird? Why is it such a weird topic? Are we just hung up about it? Does it make sense that it's like that? Is there something gross about it? Is it because capitalism is like truly gross and oppressive and we're all alienated? Or is it just that, I don't know, what is it? Why is money so weird? Well, here's one reason why it's taboo to speak about money, because it helps people in power if you don't speak about money. Think about Lily Ledbetter, right? You know, she was this woman who um, was being discriminated against because she was a woman. She wasn't being paid as much as men. And she didn't find out until much later because no one speaks about their salaries. And um, there's this huge case about whether or not she could sue later because of pay, pay discrimination. Having a culture where employees aren't allowed to speak to each other is the number one way you can pay black people less or pay women less. 
ha having a culture where uh, freelancers don't talk about how much they're getting paid leads to people getting directly screwed over. The basis of being able to organize, um, the basis of sort of being able to control your fate is based on talking with uh, your colleagues and your friends about money. And once you say, oh, that's tacky, that's vulgar, that's gross, you're actually really disempowering people. And it's weird, like I think it's really, it, it, when I saw the, when I was invited to be on this panel, you know, I've been on a lot of panels about like <coughs> how films get financed or how this gets financed, very specific things. And everyone can talk about that. Um, uh, but it's interesting when you make it more broadly about money and, and how, how we make a living and how we think about money and how money circulates and what it supports and what it doesn't support. Um, because I think you're right. I mean, it, it is, it, a lot of it is, I think, imbued with secrecy and emotion, again, that I don't think it necessarily needs to be. And it's weird that we've kind of got ourselves into a, a place where a panel just generally on money feels like quite a sort of revolutionary act. I've never been asked to be on a panel just about money before. It was always about specific money. <laughs> um, we should talk more about money. I, was, I had a really terrible idea for a website. Uh, not Kickstarter, something else. Uh, <laughs> no, I had this idea that you could have a website where you could sign up and you would, uh, like you would be anonymous, but it would just reveal your bank account and people could just watch how much money you spent all the time. <laughs> and people could like make suggestions on how you could be smarter about your money. Or mainly it would just be like porn. Just like I would want to follow like a millionaire or something and see what they did. I think that's a great idea. I think it's, yeah. I should do it. So, um, someone here should do that. <laughs> what's the most expensive thing you've bought in the past month? How about that? Let's we'll start there. Is that, is that? <laughs> I just, I just so bought dirty. a coat. Um, it was on sale at Brooklyn Industries. It was $110, I think that was it. Okay, but I also, I who have, can beat that? <laughs> I have a rule about, like I've never bought furniture, oh, it's not a rule, it's actually just I've never had enough money to buy a sofa, but <laughs> I, um, I feel really, like I do feel like when I buy a piece of furniture, like a real piece of furniture, not, you know, like a real piece, that, that it's just like I'm crossing a Rubicon and I've never done it. Yeah. And I'm halfway through my life. Almost. I know, I've, yeah, I feel, I feel I just, the same way. It just feels, I just can't buy furniture. Yeah. Anyway, that's, <laughs> that's, that's a whole other panel. <laughs> yeah, coat. <laughs> Most expensive thing you bought, Chair. Come on, bust it out. Nah, you know, I, I seriously, I, I wouldn't know because I don't, I don't even... Uh, you have someone that keeps track of that for you. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't <laughs> get or spend money, really. I don't really, I don't even pay rent. I'm lucky enough that <laughs> I, 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 I live a weird life of, uh, uh, of travels and I have a great team that work with me. And so they just ring the bell when, they, when we broke and then, then I call the police nice. to make sure we get oh, back man, on I want, time. I want your and job. So <laughs> you wouldn't want to walk with, with me because it's uh, like <laughs> you, you don't know really what your longevity is. As, as walking, but <laughs> during that time something might happen, but we don't know how long it's gonna, it's gonna last. So that's nice. why I don't really have that notion. Nice. Um, all right, well I won't make anyone answer this question, but you're welcome to answer it if you want. Have you spent, have you spent a lot of money recently? An embarrassingly large amount. Come on, no, you can admit it. Nothing that interesting. How much did this place cost? <laughs> See, that, that's the thing, it's like once you get kind of... More than Ingrid's <laughs> coat. <laughs> once you become like someone like JR or me or Yancey, you have a company and then that company spends money and then you can kind of divorce yourself from that. Yeah. I mean, no, I mean, I, I grew up in a, on a farm in Appalachia and there's a tiny airport and it's really fucking expensive to fly there, so I paid $800 to fly home for Christmas. Nice. Uh, I also took out... 25 of my friends to a nice dinner for my birthday. Was my email broken? What and happened? I, and I paid for that. <laughs> I paid for that. And I, I decided that I paid for that. I think that was like $2,500. That's the most money I spent on any single thing in a long time. Nice. It's, that was worth it. All right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask any more <laughs> vulgar <laughs> questions yeah, about money. Like I'm French and in France, we wouldn't even start a, a conference by uh, how do you make your money? That, that would be yeah. an offense. People but, would leave But in France, room. you yeah. wouldn't even ask people what they no, do no, for a living. Exactly, like, yeah, exactly, like in yeah. parties, like you would never well, go up to so someone and say, what do you do for a living? Like, yeah. that's really yeah. rude. No, it's the same here. It's the same here. That you're well, so not, it's that a little you're different here, though, I think. Like, people are, that's the first yeah, thing Yeah, you guys ask. talk about money here. I mean, you it's know, you... Not this much. Not this much. But we do. Okay, so let's talk about geography. I want to actually talk about that a little bit. So we're we're in New York, right? New York has its own thing about money. Like, it's there are more people here, I mean, in general, there's a sense that New Yorkers are not afraid to hustle, you know, to, to, to be a little bit, you know, um, upfront about, about how, you know, what they do for a living and how they make money and to be a little brusque. And 
Um, then there's the West Coast, right? The West Coast has its own culture of like uh, startups and entrepreneurs and this whole new huge, you know, um, uh, the wealth creation that's happening there because of technology and so forth, um, which you guys are a little bit a part of, you know. Um, and then there's Europe, which has its own like relationship to money. So like, how do you guys, in terms of, of where you live, now you're, we're all in New York except you, your home base, are you guys all, you live in New York? And yeah. then you live in, where's your home base? Uh, still, uh, like, mostly New York. I travel oh, mostly New York. Yeah, so, but as you travel around, like, what, how does that affect uh, some of the perceptions of uh, how people make money and, and, and things like that? You know, I, you know, I think France and Europe uh, have a different relation. Um, when you make money in France, people, you know, point you by the finger, they get jealousy. We're here, I have the feeling, maybe I'm wrong, but that people, like, kind of uh, look up to you and... Uh, so that, that that changed completely. Uh, that's why a lot of you know a lot of uh, uh, artists and stuff they travel or they change countries also. Where here in the U.S. I feel like uh, they have the country behind them and and, and supporting them. Maybe it's an outsider feeling, but um, um, th that's I think the relation we have in France with money. There's this really tension. You don't talk about salary. You don't talk about how you make money. You don't talk about model. And uh, I realize. Uh, that uh, for a long time, you know, I, I was not making money, but at least I was not taking it from branding. So I would only make with what I have, and I think that's something that you were approaching along the way. And, and it's, you know, that's one of the, 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 the magic of being an artist is you do with what you have. So even if you have to create from the sixth floor of a building with what you'll do it. And even if you didn't have enough light, then the, the painting would be that way. And we call it, that's art history. You know, at the end of the day, there's, yeah. Always, yeah. The, you know, yeah. the, there's always, and it's better because that's how the artist makes it at this time because he couldn't have all the equipment he should have had, and maybe that's, that's even better. So I'm, you know, I'm just saying that like, um, you adapt from it. And I've done some of my biggest projects from you know, almost having no studios. And so now that I have a big studio, I don't see why I should complain about anything because I didn't need a big studio to do that. So then you try to find a use in another way of, of, of that time, but you, you should know that you can do with or without. It shouldn't stop you. You're just going to have to create differently. Uh, and so I lost the track on what I was yeah. doing. No, that was good. That was awesome. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think you're right. I do think that, I mean, it's a cliche, but there is an entrepreneurial, there, there's an entrepreneurial spirit here where people do kind of not punish you for, for, for success, which I think is wonderful. The, the, the problem is the flip side of that is you do kind of get punished, I think, specifically in the US for not succeeding. Hmm. So I think the flip side is that, you know, it's really difficult if you aren't making it because there's a sort of feeling that you're not making it because you haven't tried hard enough. Um, and, and there isn't a safety net here like there is, for example, in Europe. And, I, you know, I, I do have problems with that. Um, but that said, you know, like one of the reasons I moved here is because I was seeing these amazing documentaries getting made. And I just could not figure out how they were doing it, getting made specifically in the U.S. Mm. I was like, how are they funding? Like, there's no government support. Hardly any of the TV stations support documentaries. How the hell are they doing it? And so I moved here because I wanted to figure that out, you know. And I, and I realized there is this kind of like really interesting, like, it's almost like every film is a business. Um, and people are like piecing together money and now with Kickstarter, you know, you can do that as well. It's like really creative financing and I think that's awesome and I really, really love that. Um, and I really like the, the fact here that really when you have an idea or you want to do something, people are like, yeah, do it. I'll, like, can I help you? Which I didn't find so much in London, I have to say. But the flip side of that I think is really dark. Hmm. Because if you believe that your country is a meritocracy, um, which, which I don't believe, but if you do, and you believe that the best people succeed because they're the best, you believe that people who aren't succeeding deserve it also. I think that because America's myth is that it's a meritocracy, that's why we're so brutal to the poor and the sick here. That's why we have no social safety net. I mean, it's one thing to be an artist and to be poor in Europe where you know that you're not gonna die of untreated cancer because you don't have any money. It's a totally different thing to have that in the US where you might, you know. Um, I think that the U.S., it's just very, very, very cruel to people who don't serve the interests of capital. It's, it's, really, it's really terrible to them. Um, there are, so you guys have done a bunch of different stuff. I'm looking at the artists in the, in, on the panel. Um, and uh, there are many different ways to think about when you're doing stuff, and some of it is for money in order to like just pay the rent and stuff, um, sometimes that can actually lead to good work, right? Work that you wouldn't otherwise do. 
um, uh, because, oh, the constraint of whatever, you're doing this work for hire thing or um, you're doing something that has to fit into some other structure and it ends up like producing something good. Sometimes it can be bad. Like sometimes it can lead to a trade-off that you wouldn't make if it was you and you're like, Ugh, I kind of regret this a little bit, but I'm going to do that. Has that ever happened to, to you? Have you ever been in that situation where it's either that context of, having, of doing something for money has prompted it, the, the, end, the work to be, end up being better or to end up being work, worse? Have you ever had to have, make a trade-off like that? Well, I mean, I've done some incomprehensibly stupid work for money. <laughs> um, I've done self-published children's books about squirrels in New York. Um, I've done storyboards for movies about cockroaches. Um, you know, that sounds awesome. <laughs> uh, that's, that's pretty special. But I've, but I've also, I mean, a lot of commercial jobs I've had have been great and inspiring. I recently work on, worked on a book with Matt Taibbi, who is a journalist yeah. who covers the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. He did a book that was about the prison system, and I ended up like taking a bus out to Rikers and drawing all the women, you know, lining up to visit their men there. And I, you know, drew pictures of, um, you know, people who had been like falsely arrested. I, I drew, I drew all these pictures um, to illustrate stories that Matt had found, and it was, it was an incredible collaboration. And even though it was a commercial job, it was for his book. It was something I'm really honored and proud to have done. And I think that for me, the, the collaborations that have been like that have been where people saw what I was interested in and then they sought me out for that. To, they, they, wanted, they wanted me to, to be who I was. And when I was younger and less established, I got much, much less of that and much more like doing storyboards for movies about cockroaches taking over New York. Hmm. What about you, Jer? Have you, ever, have you ever done work that's different from what you would just do if you woke up in the morning and money was, didn't even exist? Have you ever had to think, oh, I, actually, I need to do this in order to do, like, has that I mean, ever led by, to it? By a, thinking yeah. the other way around, which means by only doing things uh, that, that doesn't really follow a, a path to make money, I actually made most of my biggest projects. So hmm. for, for years, I've said uh, no to advertising, or if there was a museum show and they would have only uh, a branding sponsor, I would not do it. I would not be part of it. And so it kind of restrained all the way I was out of many shows just because of that reason. Even shows I really wanted to be in, but they say, oh, it's sponsored by this, you know, mm. alcohol brand. And uh, I was just talking just before with a friend of mine who say, you know, the, this, this big bottle of whatever uh, uh, alcohol, you know, they wanted me to do this project. And I said, oh, you know, this other guy we know did it and he regrets. So he's like, yeah, don't worry, I'm not doing it. Uh, but you know what they told me? They even wanted me to do this, uh, mm -hmm. this project to help kids um, like, uh, you know, to have kids uh, in their life, whatever. But like, it's, he said, how do they want me to say yes? Like, <laughs> to help kids at 15 years old, that I, I should come in a school and say, yeah, guys, you know, I come here with a bottle of whiskeys and <laughs> help you guys <laughs> to get better in life. That it brings you to this complete abstract world that uh, I, I never wanted to get in any way. So this actually led me to great surprises, which is why we're being artists, is because we're being artists just to try stuff and sometimes great things happen. And uh, in, in France, there's, um, you know, a lot of the monuments in France have to be renovated and, uh, and so most of the time they get a big ads in front of it. So it happens for mo most of the, one of, I mean, uh, all big monuments have to do that because it's so much money to restore those really ancient buildings. Now they just started renovating the Pantheon in Paris, which is where you buried all the greatest men of history, uh, which is, you know, the, the, the most famous monument in, in Paris, the one you see from 360 degree all over it, in, right in the center. And the head of the monument said, I don't want any fucking art on this place. So there's no way, it's the biggest budget ever, but we're not gonna get any art. And so he said, I wanna give it to an artist. And so they said, there'd be no competition, we're giving it to you because you've never worked with any advertising. So it's a statement for us. So it's crazy that I've never thought I would actually touch a monument like that. I've never even filed any paper for it. But it kind of came naturally because of the fact that for all those years you stayed in that same angle. And, um, mm. and a lot of things like that happen. Uh, the, the same way I got my studio in New York is because of someone who you know, heard of how the project was functioning and that it was a non-profit uh, project, this inside out project I'm doing. And he said, then you can use this space you know, and put your printer there. And this is a lot of like magical stuff that happened but are in the shadow of um, of normal cooperation, because a normal cooperation wouldn't get this kind of help because it doesn't function the same way. And that's why I'm never really afraid of losing things because you can go, go anywhere and draw people. You can, you can exchange a drawing against a meal. You can travel, you can use that 
like uh, exchange thing, you know, the, the truck, which is like, you know, we, we do trade, the trading system. Sure. And I, I do it a lot. I do it a lot with artists constantly. And, and, and it does work wherever you travel. If you use that skill and you just exchange skills to skill, you can actually live and sleep, uh, 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 you know, without spending any money. It, you know, in integrity might be one of those few things that exists outside of, like, the monetary system that can be easily perceived. You know, yeah. and it, it's a way that you can set yourself apart from the system and demonstrate your true values. And like, I think that's ultimately the thing that, yeah, like the one thing that you can really have to your grave. But, but like you were saying in Kickstarter, by even doing that in a monetary world, you'd make you'd make a statement that other branding would be, well, why the fuck did we we couldn't do that? Yeah. Let's buy them to do that. Yeah. But if you can't if we can't buy it, then they. They, they realize that the, the greatest project will remember are the ones of people that had integrity and just went for it, even if they would fail at it. But I'm sure you'd be so happy to do another job and be like, we've done this for those years, and we had so much fun. It would be and even if it failed at the end, we, we, during that time, at least it was ours, instead of letting it fail in other people's hands, right? I yeah, it's, it's an honor to die due to integrity, Yeah, right? Like, that's, that's the best way to go. <laughs> uh, I remember once having this meeting with this person who's like a... Uh, prominent like investor person and they're proposing to us like advertising or selling or all these sorts of things we would never do and my partner Perry and I were talking to him and kept being like no man like of course not like this no it's not like that at the very end of this thing he looked at us and sort of nodded and he goes I get it it's an authenticity play and we're like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally you nailed it but I, do, I think you I mean I think you're totally right um, but you, I think you have to be a little bit careful we have to be a little bit careful because I think that Sometimes, like, you know, obviously it's our integrity and what's right for us is not necessarily right for someone else. But also be just because of, I mean, and this is very, very true in film, I, I don't know about elsewhere, um, because so much of it is, like, about who you know and the, and the and, and, and this has changed with um, social media, by the way, I think, too. I think that has broken down a lot of those boundaries. Um, you can feel like you're doing things with integrity, but you're actually unconsciously leaving a lot of people out. Um, so when you think about things like diversity and who, and who has access... Um, to funds or um, to conferences or all those kinds of things. A lot of that, like, I think you can feel like you're doing the right thing, but you're actually excluding people by default. And I think that that's something that we probably all do way more than we think we're doing it. So I just mean, like, sometimes you think you're doing the right thing, but you're kind of, like, just excluding. Do you, does that make sense? Well, no, I, you know, I, I was trying to say this in my answer before. I try to be very aware of the fact that uh, the ability to act with a high degree of integrity and morality is a, a is a privileged position. It's a privilege of success. Uh, it's a privilege of even being in, I don't know, it, it really is. Like, who would I be in a rapidly sinking organization, you know, facing all these really tough choices? Like, if I'm the CEO of BlackBerry, you know, who am I? <laughs> uh, and there you have these crazy things to think about. Like, what's more important, like, managing the death of this thing or allowing these 10,000 people to continue to have jobs because it's about like them and their families or whatever. So like there are truly tough choices that I am fortunate to not have to think about. And so I definitely don't pat myself on the back for this sort of thing. Yeah, no, but, but I mean, I'm not even I think referring to you. Yeah, I, yeah, no, I think I know. it's just something I, that we all probably do sometimes accidentally. Um, how do we do a better job of not doing that? What can we do to avoid making that mistake? So, I mean, I think there are so many, uh, like, lots of different things. I mean, like, so, for example, I mean, I do a lot of stuff with interactive storytelling. A lot of it is actually really thinking about access. So, you know, not making sweeping statements about the Internet and mm -hmm. who has access to the Internet. Um, thinking internationally, like, beyond uh, our fund is, you know, international. But then actually thinking about, well, who would hear about it? What, like, who gets to tell the stories? Who gets to listen to those stories? Um, conferences, being really, really careful about who you put on panels, you know, who the keynotes are. I mean, th these are, it, th those are really, really small parts of it. But I think it's just actually really kind of just unpacking, unpacking things when you're thinking about, like when you think, okay, like I think this because this is how things are and then just really unpacking that all the time. It's hard to do though. I mean, I don't, I don't think I do it very well. Um, but, you know, like I do, I, I do think about that a lot because I think that filmmaking is a really, it, you, it's kind of a privileged thing to do because it's so expensive. And a lot of people, you know, I, I just, I, I would never want filmmaking to be something that kids with trust funds and kids who have access to funds like mine um, 
that they're the only people who get to tell these kinds of stories. I just think it's really important that that's not how it is. And I don't think anyone wants it to be that way. I think it's just that sometimes it kind of happens. We let it happen. I mean, isn't history taking us on the right path in terms of like, you can make a movie with an iPhone or something even cheaper. Like there's technolo technological things. And also like, it's important for us to all feel very dissatisfied with the world that we live in. But like on a geologic scale, progress is like, it's better to be alive now than any time before. Uh, and that's true pretty much anywhere in the world, I think. And hopefully those trends continue. Do we, do we all agree? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm like, I'm a total nerd and I love, I, I do, I do agree. I think that the internet, Alone. Not even it's just the huge, internet. I no, mean, no, like, I, I know that, but I, know. but I do think that the internet has really like opened up channels that just couldn't. There are ways of communicating now that have completely changed, like everything that I do, for example. And I, I think that that is almost entirely positive. There, it's not all positive, but I think mm -hmm. most of it is. Yeah. Um, I mean, al although I guess we could have a whole other argument about what the internet has done in terms of um, who gets to make a living with what, prop like what it, when things are zeros and ones, right? That's a well, we, can we, talk about it. we all do. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, me too um, now. Yeah. But what about you guys? Do you agree that it, things are better now than they ever have been on a historic, grand historical, like taking a broad view of the whole planet and the whole species? I would things say generally yes, with uh, some exceptions, mm -hmm. because I, I am cautious about everything and you know, sure. and sweeping statements like that. But yes, I mean, I look at I look at three D printing. I look at the internet. I look at advance, advances in medicine. And yes, I do think that the way the world is going is is generally positive. And I mean, the internet fills me with joy, joy and awes me. Um, the way that it breaks down borders, the way that it makes stories that wouldn't be told before told. Um, every time I see like some activist in the Middle East tweeting about a, a detention, or um, every time I see like some kid in Nigeria like doing an amazing science project, I think, my God, the, the internet is fucking amazing. And I, I feel so privileged to be alive now. But I do think that sense of dissatisfaction with the present it, that Yancey talked about is vital yeah. because that's how you keep things from going bad also. Yeah. yeah, the world doesn't naturally end up in this place. People have to yeah. push it there. And I don't even just mean technologically. I mean, it's like really on a macro level, like what we've experienced in the West in the past 10 years of like stagnation of wages and increasing economic disparity. Those things will probably continue. What's also happened is that in other parts of the world, life has gotten a lot better and will continue to and sort of money is gonna shift to other parts of the world and it might mean that like Europe and North America are gonna suck in 100 years, which we might look at as the end of the world, but like for everyone, people who live in Asia and Africa or wherever else, they're like, shit's pretty good now, finally. Like, fuck those Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I don't know, I just yeah. think like this stuff is just moving. You yeah. know? Um, I wanna ask one last question then we're gonna open it up to the, to the audience. Um, I think in general, creative people, I think everyone on this panel would probably, um, uh, agree with the, the idea that there are a lot of things that they're interested in pursuing that are totally non-monetary, right? Um, the um, uh, fame, to, you know, to a certain degree, like respect, uh, admiration of other people, um, respect of our peers, a critical uh, estimation, um, the, uh, uh, these kinds of things are the type of things that, that typically motivate um, creative people. And, um, and I guess my question is, I've always thought of that as being admirable, right? That that's in, in contrast to the pursuit of money. But in kind of preparing for this panel, it made me think, well, why is that? Why do I just assume that that's better? I mean, it's just a different set of things to want. You're still going after the things you want. Those are the things that make you happy. Other people are made happy by money. So am I, I now I can't decide. Like, what do you guys think about, like, is there something to, to admire, is that morally better to want to be, I don't know, admired and respected as opposed to just to want an extra, you know, bunch of money? It's interesting. The whole paradigm of reality television really comes from privileging fame over money because reality stars, I mean, in terms of, and anyone who works in reality television, in terms of TV are the most ripped off people. Like, they sign terrible deals for, for the humiliation they get. They make so little money, but they're doing it because they don't care. They, they care about, everyone looking at them. That's the currency that they want. Um, I don't think that's a more valuable currency to pursue than money. In fact, I think money might even be more valuable than that. I guess it depends what else, what, what you're pursuing. Admiration, the pursuit of admiration could be you wanting people to like admire the fancy clothing you have, or it could be you wanting people to admire the achievements you've made for mankind. Yeah. 
I think there are probably fewer victims if you're searching for respect than if you are money. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it does actually, it is morally better. And I think you could make an yeah, argument. Yeah, well, if you're, unless you're a dictator. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's good. Demand respect. Yeah, yeah. Kim Jong Il really wanted respect. Yeah, it's true. Just, uh, just like Picasso, right? Um, any other last thoughts before we open it up to the, to the crowd for questions? Let's do it. Right. Question time. First, uh, yeah, prepare your best tomatoes. First question, I think, is Ida's. Um, well, I, I want to thank Ingrid for summing up the whole reason that we're doing this and that thinking about money a little bit means we all get to think about it a lot less. So thanks. You put it better than we did. Um, uh, I thought it was interesting. I mean, the, the, the argument against brands, I feel like I've heard a lot. And I've also heard a little bit of the argument against VC, but I've never heard it happen in the same conversation. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. And I wonder if there's something that brands and VC want that like intrinsically threatens this, this integrity that we all seem to have decided is, is the, the okay thing, the right thing. Well, you know, I just think that, um, you know, there's no such thing as free money. There's a cost that comes with all of it. Um, and you have to understand what that secondary cost is. So for a brand, it is that you're subsuming your ideas within the corporate goals of some larger entity. Um, you know, I think for VC, it's a very similar sort of thing. Uh, what I find interesting is that I feel like, you know, the title of this was about selling out. I feel like selling out became okay like seven or eight years ago. And like there was like no one sent out a memo. There was no like conference call that I'm aware <laughs> of. It just happened. And I think it first happened with bands. Um, you know, it's like the moment the white stripes do like a Levi commercial or whatever. Like it used to be something that you would people really felt torn about. We all wanted to be Ian Mackay and and Discord and like that was the ethos we ascribed to. And certainly that's what the Beatles were and Kurt Cobain was and all this. And that has just died. And now we no longer think about it at all. Now there's like the Converse house down the street where like a band will record a song and have Converse make their video and like no one thinks twice about it. And it's a very curious thing to me because it's just like, I don't know when that decision was made that we just no longer gave a shit. Here's um, a but it seems like we, no one does. Here's a question about um, selling out in bands. To me, the Venn diagram was like this. So you had the bands with intense integrity and a ton of corporate cash behind them in the form of their record label, right? <laughs> so they could decline other forms of corporate cash. And as the record label, as that sort of amount of cash went down, then to compensate the amount of selling out to, or not, the amount of um, hawking brand stuff went mm -hmm. up. But the, I feel like the corporate, the um, evil corporation providing cash actually remained constant. It was just which one it was coming from. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think a lot of that also goes back to um, the internet, right, and how media circulates, because now with content, you know, because brands are trying to reach you across all these different platforms, um, I think that they, you know, it used to be like you could have the, the TV show that was supported by ads, but you, the, the ads knew their place. Yeah. And it was kind of controlled. And now, like, ads want to be everywhere. And, like, the, the, the less they look like an ad, the cooler they can be. Mm -hmm. And so, and, like, now you have, I can't remember what it's called, like, the content in magazines that kind of looks like it's the editorial. Yeah. Advertorials. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, like... I, it's happening so much, and sometimes I, I like I really can't tell. It's like when I read the Onion once, and I thought it was a real newspaper. Well, like the Super Bowl, the <laughs> fact that commercials are content is like the most amazing concept right. ever. Like whoever whoever nailed that would just like really. But I think hit that's a home when every, I think that's when we, when everyone sort of sold out, and we didn't notice or, yeah. or say anything. Like the two kind of went together. I don't know if anyone read the uh, K Hole Youth Mode report. This is where Normcore came from last week. It was uh, a cultural report by like five people here in New York. The group is called Cahill. It is fucking brilliant. Really, really incredible. Uh, it talks about mass indie, uh, youth mode, and norm core. And this idea of selling out and just the fact that it is irrelevant is a large, is a big strain in it. But it's really, really smart at like identifying exactly what this is about. Check it out. Now we're going to open it up to the audience. Questions? Let's start with Colin. Uh, I have a question for JR and Wendy. Uh, you guys both talked about saying no uh, to maintain integrity, whether that's to a brand or to, uh, uh, to investors. Uh, so I was just wondering, what did you guys say yes to that brought you to be on this panel? Uh, that, you know, like, what, what did you hold out for that you felt like, this is somebody I can work with? Well, 
did I get the question? I'm not sure. When did I say okay. yes to the um, to the panel? You mean? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. What did you say yes to? What did you ah, What did yeah. you say yes to in your life okay, that led okay, you to sorry. be here? Uh, no, I guess um, you know I, I used I, I used to do other jobs than to, to finance what I want you know my art and uh, and then slowly I realized that my only business model if I wanted to keep freedom would be to sell stuff that I would do myself so that this way I would you know have something exchange it would be my money and with that money I could spend it the way I want and then slowly it it, it grew on. Basically, I've al always done stuff depending on what I had, and that's still what I'm doing today. So I would never try and raise money and be like, okay, for this project I need that much, and then I would work for two years trying to get that money. I never work that way. I'm like, if I have 100 bucks, then I would do that whole project with 100 bucks. And then it's how to stay in that form. And then when it becomes just a model, you just keep going in there. And sometimes you do huge projects, and sometimes you do smaller ones, and sometimes you combine things. So I, I, I guess at some point I completely lose track on how because same thing in France, you cannot, the Ministry of Culture don't give any more financing, and I know here it's even worse, but in France there used to be this kind of, you know, way to have money that, that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, when you do books and stuff like that, I quickly realized that you don't really make money at all. You actually have to buy books from your own editor, so, y you know, <laughs> you don't, you don't. And so, you know, it only came, it's only coming from, from the sales of, of, of art pieces. And I've, even that, I've limited it because, um, because I believe that if I produce the same amount of artworks a year and I keep it really limited, then of course there's some year that's gonna be more struggling, but over the time, if I'm only basing everything on that, then those artworks should be more rare, and so it would actually give me more time to produce the works, uh, you know, that, that, that kind of, um, you know, for me it's all about the journey you're going through, not really the goal, but the journey, so I always try to, to, to reach some crazy goals that I might never reach, but that journey is the most interesting part because that's where you meet people. This, this is where you build your model. This is where you work in team. When you get to that goal, it's over. So, you know, it, you might, you know, you, you, you arrive at that point and then that's where you have to find your new goal. So, in that process, I'm just, you know, I, I don't, I can't tell I have a direct goal. I just know that I'm enjoying the journey as it goes. As, a, as an artist, that's, you know, that's what I believe we're doing it for, is we're doing it for that journey. It's, we're doing it because we don't know when we wake up in the morning exactly where we're gonna be, but uh, there, there might be something interesting in there. Next question. Oh wait, Molly? Oh, oh I, sorry. Thought, I thought it was for Yancey. That was for me? Yeah, okay. yeah what did you say yes to? Uh, you said no to VC, right? Yeah, I don't what know. We, yes just, we just like, uh, I mean before this I just had jobs, so I'm not particularly admirable or anything. Uh, but for us, you know, we, we took money from uh, our friends and from uh, uh, artists. The very first investor in Kickstarter was David Cross from Mr. Show and Arrested Development. Um, and so that's a weird person to take money from. Uh, <laughs> David's great. Uh, but no, I mean, I think it was just trying to build a system that we thought actually would do some good. Um, you know, we don't take any money from anyone other than the 5% that we raise, like, are, we're very transparent about it. Um, yeah. can, I, can I ask a follow-up question? Have you made any mistakes along the way? It sounds like Kickstarter did a lot of things right. Was there anything that you felt you know, money-related that you wish you had done differently? Money-related? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. In terms of how you structure it, anything that you would be willing to share with us? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, again, we're fortunate that most of our mistakes, so like, I got involved in Kickstarter in 2005 when I met my, my partner, Perry. Uh, the site didn't launch until 2009, so there's four years of us, and Charles who came in a couple years later, four years of us working on this thing before there was any website. So we were just going around telling people about this amazing idea we had, and people looked at us like, are you fucking kidding me? Uh, like, no, no one cared. We didn't know how to make anything. Um, so most of the mistakes we made were then when no one gave a shit about us, which is a great time to make mistakes. Um, and at that point, we raised money from uh, a lot of our friends and, uh, and people like David. Um, and got enough money to hire people to try to build the website for us because we didn't know how to do that. Um, and we were so dumb and like trying to find people to help us build the website. We'd meet someone and be like, seems like a good dude, let's do it. Uh, <laughs> and then like made that mistake three times and lost all of our money multiple times. And uh, it was really dark. It was really, really, really dark, really dark. And, huh. um, and so that sucked. Uh, and then fortunately we met a couple good people, uh, especially a guy named Lance who's still with us who like, were actually 
people with integrity who help us make this thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I make mistakes every day. Uh, you know, um, there's no stopping that. You just have to try to have a self-awareness about what is it that drove you to make that mistake, and you try to own up to it, and that's about as good as you can do. So. Okay, next question. I mean, I think historical context is fascinating. I thank my lucky cards every day that I'm not doing PR for mass murderers like Michelangelo was, you know, <laughs> um, which is actually what most Renaissance artists were doing if you look at it historically. Um, I, I find context fascinating. I find the way the tech of the time influences things fascinating. I find all the religious allusions and the cultural metaphors and in-jokes fascinating. I love to like look at Carlos and Carlo Crivelli and think like, why did he use that bird? Oh, it meant this. I think that looking at historical context, which money is part of, it lets you read paintings in this like total, in this totally interesting insider way that, that I love to do. And to me, that doesn't take away from the transcendental thing at all. Like I can look at a Persian miniature and be like, oh my God, that's blue. I, I want to die. It's so lovely. And then also think about how it was made on an assembly line with different um, specialists doing the clouds and the mountains and the faces. I, to me, to me, they're all just different levels that that you can enjoy something on. Just like you can read Ernest Hemingway, and you could be like, "Oh my God, this prose is amazing!" And then you can also know stuff about his biography and his experiences in the Spanish Civil War, and bring that to your reading. But you, you, you would make the step, like you said, to to like you would see the painting of Michelangelo, and then you would read the context behind and realize yeah. who he did it for. The things that the Brun are doing differently today is they want to be on that piece. So. Like this piece is br is brought to you by Nissan, you know, and and by even the the, the model of the cars. So that's what have changed. Is that, you know, I, I, it's interesting to know that this artist made that artwork, and then when you search for it, you realize that he have this or that patron, and then you actually make that step. But the first impact to the work was you and the artwork. And right now, that's the thing that I'm really afraid that's changing. Is that sometimes when you go to museum, it's not anymore you know, the Tate Modern present this artist with the help of Gucci, it's Gucci present, uh, you know, at this, uh, at this museum, uh, this but, artist. I mean, if, if God is the brand, God is front and center in a lot of that art. I mean, right? I mean, if the Catholic Church is the, is the equivalent of <laughs> Nissan, Nissan's front and center in those yeah, paintings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of the reason that we don't view the brand front and center is because we don't live with those brands anymore because the, the House of Medici is totally irrelevant to us. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but their faces were drawn into his, or, or were painted into or sculpted into these things. Um, I think that a viewer then might have viewed the political content of that work as much more overwhelming than we do now. Mm -hmm. um, let's go over here. Everything you guys do is amazing and wonderful, and um, and I love the various bringing it back to uh, like the class analysis of everything you guys are saying. Um, can you talk about in your own experience what you guys you guys kind of brushed on access, and so like how you like maybe bring like a working class narrative or perspective in what you do? Like, is that something that's is I mean, is it possible for a working class filmmaker? to access what you can give out more than just giving maybe like some other filmmakers the resources to tell stories about working class people or where you guys have your art present. It's like present out in the streets and it's accessible to, you know, every, and you make everything accessible. So can you guys talk about maybe access and the context of class today where everything is becoming more and more separate? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so that's a, it, there's so much in there. I mean, it's class, there's, so there's class, there's representation, there's all these layers, um, it, when, and I'm speaking specifically about filmmaking and specifically about documentary filmmaking. And 
you know, one of the things, um, I was actually just over the, pa over the weekend on this panel about making films about Africa, and, um, and it, got, it was really, really, it was a really tricky panel. Um, and I think, you know, there, there is this sort of weird import-export business with documentaries where there's a lot of filmmakers who will go away to another country and make a film about the other place, and then those films will then kind of get imported back into the US where they'll be shown at Sundance or Tribeca or wherever. And it's, a, it's weird. I mean, and they're, they're often fantastic films made by curious people. And, uh, you know, and I, I definitely don't believe that we should only make, tell stories about where we are, because actually part of what makes the world so exciting is like looking elsewhere, right? I mean, that's what's so great about making art. Um, but I did, one of the reasons that I started working on the, the fund that I'm running now is that actually it's not about linear documentaries, it's about um, uh, interactive documentaries, which means that we do, get to experiment with like how those projects get made, with what equipment, and then, and then how they get disseminated or circulated. So it's almost like we're thinking not so much about distribution, but about circulation, and there's no business model for a lot of the stuff that we do. Um, you know, a lot of it's free websites or stuff on mobile phones. And, and that's kind of why I got so excited about it. Um, there are a whole bunch of other issues around then, like what happens when you don't have the three act structure and you don't have the narrative arc and all of that other stuff. But, it, it has been a really interesting ride, and it's specifically the reason I wanted to do it was exactly about the questions that you're asking about access and, and, and storytelling and who gets to tell those stories. But it is really fraught, you know. And at the end of the day, um, you know, when we were sitting on that panel over the weekend, we were four white American, well, I'm not American, but, you know, four white Westerners talking about making films elsewhere. And, and even though we were trying really hard not to, the whole conversation kept getting framed that way. And it, you know, it's just hard to get away from that. But I, 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 you know, I still, there's something about the internet and social media and the fact that it's global, ubiquitous and cheap that I, I can't help but be excited about the possibilities for that, even though I don't think we're quite there yet. I don't know if I, that really answers your question. Can I, I, I challenge the idea that we're more separate than ever. Um, you know, I think like, just in a very mundane way, I don't know, is Warren Buffett's like cell phone that much nicer than mine? I mean, I think mine's probably cooler. Uh, just because I doubt he has an iPhone, but uh, I mean, like there is there is this degree of uh, uh, disparity in terms of someone having just just god loads of money that we can't uh, really comprehend, but also like the quality of living in general for most people has gone up considerably to where the differences I think are actually pretty slight compared to the difference between being like a serf and a lord, um, and certainly there are areas of real poverty. Um, uh, I grew up in one, the house I grew up in still could not get internet even if we wanted to. Um, and so there are real issues of access along those lines. But in general, um, I think that certainly looking from a wa straight wage perspective, there are differences. But I, th I think the standard of living has risen in general for most people uh, in ways that we quickly become accustomed to um, that maybe make some of those differences on a day-to-day -day level not as large. I think there are many exceptions to that. But I think like the, the inequality um, trend as something that people are talking about, I certainly know what people are discussing. But I think there, there are other factors that make that not as clear cut as it seems. But even beyond that, I mean, art is still a realm of the privileged, right, in general. In the, I mean, I'm talking globally here, not just in the US. I guess. I mean, I think that there's like the, right, there's the hierarchy needs of like survival and then, you know, on up. And certainly where you're born is going dic to largely dictate you know, what you're able to think about. Um, so certainly I am fortunate to grow up in a way that I didn't have to think about staying alive. That was something that my mom thought about on my behalf or things like that. Um, so there definitely there are degrees of these things that are in Fine art is typically still the domain of the super wealthy, but not, uh, not art in general. Like pop culture has, right. right, made, like film and music are no longer the realm of the privileged, right? Well, I guess it depends. I, I just think it's, a, I think it sort of depends where you are because I, I still think that like who gets, like who pays attention to whose art is still really deeply unequal, you know, and, 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 and like so lots of people may be making the work but it's, I don't think we're necessarily paying attention to it at film. And so the, I mean this is a whole other question again, mm -hmm. it's about gatekeepers and curation and what gets chosen and what gets pushed forward. Um, and I, I, yeah, I do, I do think it's unequal still. Well, in fine art, very often, um, the career path might be from an MFA program to a gallery, and MFAs are very, very, very expensive. Um, 
but they, but they provide the entree that a lot of people need into galleries. And there are you know many many exceptions. Um, you know there are many you know brilliant people who didn't take that path. But as long as expensive advanced degrees are considered an essential credential, it makes a field founded on inequality. Okay, final question. Who has a really good question? <laughs> he put his hand up after you said a really good question. <laughs> so I, <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. My question is for Yancy, um, and it's about your perspective on evolution of the reward system, something that JR mentioned also, just this idea of bartering as the currency for artists. Um, so I recently ran my first Kickstarter for to fund a low-budget documentary film, um, and I don't think that my uh, supporters um, gave us a dollar in exchange for a tweet, a personalized tweet, you know, which was the lowest criteria for um, a reward. So I'm just wondering what you think will, what are the new tools or what is the Kickstarter kind of um, vision for how that's going to evolve? Yeah, I mean, I, d I definitely think about this from like the Lewis Hyde, the gift perspective of just like ways that we are exchanging, expressing love between one another. Uh, you know, we, we um, always built this model with the idea of rewards being central because we didn't like, we wanted a project to benefit everyone and so that this to be a very communal experience and we thought that if it were just people asking other people for money and it was a one-way relationship that that is, I don't know, it's clearly not sustainable uh, uh, or just a particularly great experience for everyone. Um, you know, I, I think that, I, th I mean, I think that the, the desire to create is because we have a desire to speak and we want to say things a certain way, and I have to believe that part of the desire is wanting other people to hear those things and appreciate them and experience them. Um, and you know, it's certainly something I like about both JR and Molly's art is that it's very much geared towards an audience, not a specific audience, but this knowledge that like this is meant to be experienced and shared. Um, and so I would think rewards on, for us are just it's a very tangible, practical sort of example of that. But I do think that's important. I mean, not you know, someone can create something for just for themselves or someone like the. Um, what is the performance artist uh, who did the series of year-long works where he like lived outside for a year or tied himself to another person for a year? I forget his name, Tony Ching, something like that. Uh, but anyway, so he, he did these series of works every year throughout the 80s, and they're very intense things, very, very intense things. And then for a span of 15 years, he decided he would continue to do a series of year-long works, but he would not tell anyone about them nor share them with anyone else. And so there's this art book of all of his works, and the entire last three quarters of the book are just blank pages of just him like not sharing what it was that he did. Um, I think that's absurd, but also like kind of amazing. Uh, but in general, I just think that we create things because we want other people to appreciate them. I have to believe that that's one of the core motivations. So I, I think it's just very reflective of that. I would love to hear what you guys think about. Yeah, that. I mean, you, you create things because you want to share and sometimes uh, you create things because you want interaction. and and. And maybe that's, that's that tweet you're talking about, that you know, someone want to be part of it in a way or another. Uh, that's what I felt a lot in, the, you know, I, in this inside art project where I just give posters to people, even for free, and they can just paste it wherever they want. I didn't invent anything. You can go at, at the coffee top at the corner, or the, uh, what's the name here, Kinko's, and you can actually do it. You don't need at all to go to the website and all that stuff. It's just people want to be part of a movement. People want to be part of something. And, uh, and, um, and so it's interesting that depending on the context, and you were talking about how art um, you know, is reserved to privilege or not, I feel like it's crossing boundaries. Because you know, 15 years ago, photography was a rich spot. You couldn't do photography. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of when I started, when it, the, the digital arrived. And I flew around the world because there's low-cost company now. And I'm printing because. I can do digital photo and it costs nothing. And uh, you know, if I was born 20 years earlier, I might, you know, I, I wouldn't do what I do now. So it's by using and tweaking the system. But uh, so the people I send those posters to anywhere in the world, you know, at some point, uh, you know, when I was only going in places and taking photos and pasting them, people were like, yeah, but you choose to go to those places, you know. And I was like, not really. When I go in those places, actually, people want me to do it, and so I do it with them. But I couldn't. You know, it was just my voice against yours. 
And then when I stopped going in those places and I say, look, I'm going to stay home, I'm going to send those photos and let's see who wants them. And it's actually their photos, I'm just printing. And you could see that it was coming from all over, from people in Afghanistan and people in Tunisia and people, you know, in the middle of America or in New York. You know, doesn't matter of the color of the people, the social class or anything, it's just people have this feeling of existence and, and they want to share it, you know, depending, it doesn't matter where they're from. And, and because of the internet and because of that technology, it's actually getting to places that we would never thought that art would get into, mm -hmm. but that people would integrate it much faster than actually we do. When I go in those countries, people ask me, what is the purpose of your project? And that's the deepest question of art, you know, because you have to answer what you're really looking for by doing this. Where when I'm doing it in New York or in Paris, People ask you who's going to clean that shit and you know, <laughs> is artifacts going to pay. Like the questions are much more material around it. So I find that interesting being challenged by the complete different context of where you're bringing this, this art. And uh, I don't know if it's you know, answering this question or it's just continuing our discussions, but uh, uh, this is it. I, um, I draw because I can't do anything else. It's a compulsion. It reminds me of picking at scabs. Um, I remember one point I was I was arrested and I was like in this I was in this jail cell and I'm like so bored like I like to the point where boredom is torture and I have this like styrofoam cup and I start like digging in little drawings on the cup with my nail you know I, because that's because that's what I do that's like the only way that I can interface with reality is to draw if I was stranded on a desert island I would draw on the sand if I was quadriplegic I would draw with my eyes using that like cool glasses set that lets you draw with light it's it's all I can do, and, and that's why I, I need to make money and think about that so that I can get away with drawing and not do anything else ever. <laughs> okay, so I have one final question for you. Um, we asked you guys to be here because each of you uh, does something or has talked about something that we admire. Who do you admire? Who do you think is navigating this space really well? Um, you mentioned Lewis Hyde, who wrote the book The Gift, which, like, Everybody should read. There isn't anyone who shouldn't read The Gift. Everybody should read The Gift. Who do you guys admire? I love the photographer Clayton Cubitt. He, um, he has something that I so admire in people, which is this voracious desire to consume all of life and their art. He went down to uh, New Orleans right after Hurricane Katrina, where his mom is from, and he did pictures of all the hurricane survivors. He does... He does a series called Hysterical Literature that's women reading from a book and like having an orgasm below the table, but you can't see anything. You just see them reading fully clothed. <laughs> he um, does brilliant fashion photos and, in, and like photos of Thai kickboxers. And he does, he does everything. And um, Clayton is really interesting in the way that he navigates digital space. For instance, he got tired of people constantly writing to him and being like, can I buy you a coffee and pick your brain? And so he wrote, he set up something called Interoclayton, where for the price of a coffee, you get a guaranteed answer to whatever your question is. And the more money you put into it, the uh, more thought he'll put into the answer. <laughs> he, um, went, during, her, during uh, Katrina, his mother's house was destroyed. And before, before Kickstarter, before crowdfunding was even a word, he crowdfunded money to rebuild it. He called it Project Eden. And he had a, he had a update, you know, a blog um, and a photo diary for that. He, um, his Instagram is this amazing and hilarious challenge to the prudery of terms of service agreements. He goes around censoring classic works of art so that they can uh, meet the TOS of Instagram. I, I suggest you all look at Clayton Cubitt. I think he is amazing. Me? You know, I admire people that, um, that um, you know, like we, we talked before, that, that produce what they're doing, uh, respecting, you know, their co code, basically, people with code. And, uh, and it's this, the same kind of people that I've seen to certain artists, which is really rare, but also I'm lucky to do what I do because of certain people that are actually in the shadow of it are making it happen, and, and that's something. And they don't even do it for the credit. They just do it because they believe there's a, a larger message. And, and so I, I believe uh, artists, a lot of people, you know, you, you, you go through your career because of certain people. Whoever, if you're a big artist, a small artist, famous, not famous, you have people. It could be your mother, it could be friends, it could be someone that's gonna buy your painting that you'll never actually meet. But those people that are behind, that are actually supporting you, uh, not really knowing where you're going. I had people supporting me and people 
you know, giving me space or stuff without really knowing where this was all going. But like that trust that comes from, you know, I, I don't know if you should call it patrons or I don't know how you call it because uh, the, the, those are for me the real, you know, shadow philanthropist of your, of your journey. Uh, and, 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 and I guess that's, that's how a lot of artists, you know, uh, survive. And sometimes they don't realize it. it doesn't need to be a big person. Sometimes it's just your neighbor, it's your friend, it's your brother, it's your, uh, it's someone close, uh, and uh, and that's actually, you know, help you uh, uh, go through your journey. And it's, uh, and and those people will never get maybe rewarded for it, but uh, that's how actually a lot of the artists, a lot of the filmmaker, uh, happen to do what they do. That's that's the family model. It's like your family says, uh, you're a part of our family, so we love you, and we're going to support you. The best families work like that. Yeah. Who else do you admire? How about some institutions? Uh, <laughs> no. I admire Creative Castle, actually. I, I really, like, I've learned a lot from them about um, thinking about how you support artists over time. Like, so, like, a career, like, a, a career of art rather than here's one project, go broke, never do it again. You know, like, that real investing in a person and investing in their work over time, I think, is, is really amazing. I also, I mean, I admire everyone who supports art, and I think artists are incredible. Um, uh, and I admire them all, and I think that creating like a, the, the support around your work and people who allow that to happen are amazing. But I also, like increasingly, and maybe that's just because of what I do now, I, I look beyond, I guess, art more and more, I feel like. So looking at people like Juliana Rochich, who is in Kenya, who started Ushahidi, and now the, the Brick, which is this um, kind of really cool internet modem thing which allows you to get access wherever you are. Um, I think people like that are amazing because they are actually going to change how work gets created in the future. Um, and again, <laughs> going back to my, my, my uh, you know, uh, thing about like, who gets to tell their stories, but I do think like, people like that are actually going to open doors in ways. That, like, they may not be in the art world, but they're actually going to change the kind of art that gets made. Um, so Tim Berners-Lee, I guess, would be my other one. The World Wide Web has changed a lot. I've got four. Uh, <laughs> I've had time to think. Uh, institution, um, Folkways, Smithsonian Folkways, mm -hmm. uh, that was started by Alan Lomax and Harry Smith. Its goal was to document all aspects of sound. It's like, that's fucking baller mission right there. <laughs> uh, and those records are great, like sounds from the junkyard, sounds of the office. These are like incredible records. Um, uh, I got to work with them on some of that. It was amazing. So love Folkways. Uh, Kanye um, is like one of my biggest heroes. Um, He's just fully himself, uh, incredible levels of integrity. Um, you know, all the reasons why people hate him are the reasons that I love him. You know, I, I think he really understands who he is as a person and artist, and I admire the shit out of him. Uh, this woman named Karen Chen, who's a film producer, um, who makes a lot of movies that uh, you probably haven't seen. Um, last movie she had in theaters is a movie called Circumstance, which is about uh, Iranian uh, lesbian teenagers. But she's just uh, a wonderful human being and, um, and a friend. And whenever I talk to her, I learn a lot. But it is really centered around questions of integrity and things like that. She has more of it than anyone I know. Um, and the last person I would say who's been my hero since I was like 13 would be Ian Mackay from Fugazi and runs Discord. Uh, for fucking 30 years, $5 to see a show, $10 to buy an album. He'll talk to anyone who wants to talk to him. The most approachable person there is. Has a code. I love codes, I think about codes a lot. Has a code and knows exactly what he is and what he wants to do and he stuck to it for a long time. And you know, I think that's an incredible thing. Oh, me? Um, Tom Sharpling, uh, best show on WFMU. It's a freeform radio station. For 20 years, this guy's been doing like world-changing, like amazing radio. Uh, just beautiful, brilliant, life-saving, um, uh, work never made a dime. It's a you know freeform non-commercial radio station. Um, yeah, he's my hero. It's amazing. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks. you so much. Thank Let's you. round. I think now's the time for a round of applause. Selling out is easy to do. It's not so hard. To find a buyer for you When money talks You're under its spell Ah, but what do you have When there's nothing left to sell 